from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 52, recorded on January 20th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome back. Great to see everybody. Is it it's, snowing up there? It is snowing up here. <laughs> How about that? Because it's raining down here, so must be snowing up where you are. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hi, hey everyone. Great to be back. Look at us. First episode of the new year. Yeah, I can see it's year. raining out your window. It is. Yes, and it's supposed to turn to um, ice and things are shutting down. In North Carolina, when it when there's ice, everything shuts down. Have you have you heard about my new painting here at the incubator? I saw an Instagram post okay. that there's an, a gentleman who painted in a, in a picture of Ebola virus. Yeah, correct? so it's a big painting behind me. And the guy is from uh, from Raleigh, actually. Oh, He's, okay, that's I'll where check he him lives. Out. And uh, this, so uh, I did an interview with him yesterday. You can hear it. Um, oh, wow. He's a very interesting guy. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Um, it was snowing earlier. I don't think we have rain yet. Our guest today is coming back from TWIV 161, 2011. He was like 10 years old back then. <laughs> now he's at the Rockefeller University. Gabriel Victoria, welcome back. Thanks, Vince. It's great to be here. Um, I guess you know my weather. We're, we're in the same city. But, uh, <laughs> Far, yeah. yeah well, maybe it's uh, cooler up, up north, but uh, not, <laughs> not the most beautiful day. The, the, the sun seems to be trying to show up. Yeah, definitely no sun here. So, so Gabriel, uh, in 2011, you were at the Whitehead, correct? I think I was moving there. I, was, uh, um, I had sort of just graduated as a PhD student here at Rockefeller from uh, Michelle Newsom's Weig's lab, and I... Okay. I, I did a, I stayed a little bit longer after my PhD before I moved to a, to a Whitehead Fellow position. Um, sort of the, this post PhD mm -hmm. program where they, they let you run a lab for a few years wow. instead of doing a postdoc. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> pretty neat. They're brave. Yeah, they're brave. <laughs> and uh, I was just about to start that, but, but I was still a okay. new worker. And then you, yeah, that's because you, you, you did come to uh, my office for that, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, you returned to Rockefeller. What year was that? I uh, came here in the fall of 2016, so just a little over five years ago. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, we are remiss in not having you back earlier, but here you are. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in science and what brought you to your PhD in Nuisance Wise Lag? Yeah, I took a very weird trajectory. Um, I I, uh, I used to be a classical pianist uh, by training. I went to college here at uh, Manus College, uh, which used to be on the Upper West Side in New York, uh, to do classical piano. I, I spent several years there. I did a master's also. Wow. Then uh, after that, I went back to Brazil, where I'm from, and I played piano and taught music for, for a few years. And... Uh, at that point, I was getting a little bit burned out. Uh, I think, you know, I probably took me a lot more effort to to be a good pianist than it should. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I I, uh, I ended up drifting away and, and trying other things. At some point, I thought science was a cool thing to do. My my father is a, an epidemiologist uh, who was actually pretty busy with uh, yeah, COVID in Brazil uh, yes. these, uh, mm. th this past couple of years. And, and, you know, I was talking to him. He said, uh, I was living in Sao Paulo at the time. He said, well, there's a med school friend of mine who uh, has a lab in Sao Paulo. He, he's an immunologist. Why don't you go talk to him? And I, I was thinking more about genetics. And, and I thought genetic engineering was cool. I didn't really know what it was, but it, it sounded cool. <laughs> so I went to talk to this, uh, this friend of his. And he said, oh, just come and volunteer in the lab and, you know, do PCRs. That's what I did, PCRs genotyping uh, patients for polymorphisms. Uh, and, and I worked there for, for a year, and then I ended up uh, um, staying and doing a master's there. And, and I always like to say that it, it just happened to be immunology, and that's why an immunologist, if, if he was doing uh, 
you know, neuroscience as I probably have been a neuroscientist. So it wasn't a, a grand design that I chose to be an immunologist. But so, uh, Although there are B cells in the brain. So. Well, yes, now uh, neuroscience and immunology have uh, yes. merged. Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we did a paper on, on twin the other day about when you have immune responses, they're stored as memories in the brain and they can be that recalled. Was wild. Yeah. That it's was wild. wild. Yeah. Amazing. Well, it's a very cool background. I actually, if you, if you, for those who want to, if you YouTube your name, I mean, you'll find your science talks, but you'll find, I don't know if it was Mozart or Bach, but you'll find a piano concertos as well. Yeah. Something I recorded in, I think, (laughs) 2002. Yeah. 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 20 years ago. (laughs) Do you still play at all? I do. I, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was an editor at JM, Thiago Carvalho, used to live here. He left to Portugal. And he left me his uh, electric uh, piano that he had bought uh, for his kids uh, to learn. So I put it in my living room and I'm playing this, uh, playing the piano. Uh, <laughs> nice. A couple hours, a couple hours a day to awesome. wow. get well, my that brain. Was, that was Twiv 161 was Concerto in B. Mm-hmm. Perfect title. <laughs> One of the, yeah, top 10 titles of, uh, it was, was it really Alan good. who came up with that? Alan <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yep. Well, I guess, you know, one could argue your favorite structure in the body, your favorite organ is the germinal center. I think even your website is germinal.center. <laughs> whatever the, you know, the end is. So for cool. our audience, you know, they may be familiar with germinal centers, but can you talk about them um, and inter- a little intro to them? How do B cells get there? What, you know, what is their purpose? And then we can dive into your papers. You've published a lot in the last couple of years and, and really relevant, we think, you know, to SARS-CoV-2 specifically and vaccination boosters. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we've all heard a lot about antibodies, right? And, and uh, one thing I find pretty amazing about, and, and it's not just me, this is what history of, uh, of immunology tells us was the initial problem, is that you, you can really make antibodies to almost anything. So, so just imagine this, you, your body is injected with something, um, it can be a virus, protein, it can be an allergen, it can be even a chemical that, that you can come up with. And you will find an antibody in your body that can bind to this thing with very high affinity and stick to it and, uh, and prevent it from doing whatever it would do if it were a, 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 nasty, a nasty pathogen or chemical. Right? But the question is this, you have a genome that codes for something like 20,000, has 20,000 genes in it. How can you have an antibody for, for almost everything? Imagine how many different molecular structures there are in... Uh, in the world or in the universe and and, and imagine that uh, this infinity of structures can all be seen by uh, by antibodies so how is it that, that the the organism can come up with uh, antibodies that do all of this you need infinite genes if it were a simple one gene one um, one uh, antibody model right so the thing is the adaptive immune system is very smart it does a couple of things. One thing uh, that B cells do, which is common to what T cells do, is it doesn't have one gene to make the receptor that it uses to recognize all these different things. It has uh, different combinatorial fragments that it can assemble and stitch together. Um, So for example, one of the chains of the antibody in uh, in mice, the heavy chain, uh, uh, which is the larger protein in the antibody, has... um, a hundred something segments called V segments, something like 10 segments called D segments and four segments called J segments. And just from that, you can assemble any V with any D with any J. You can make a ton of different antibodies just out of one gene. Also, when you assemble them, you don't assemble them very precisely. So there's a lot of variation there. You also have two chains that you put together out of three possible chains. So the heavy chain will, uh, join with the kappa light chain or with a lambda light chain. So combinatorially, you can get something like two and a half million different combinations. And if you add these imprecisions at the joining, you get some ridiculous number, like 10 to the 14 different antibodies that you can make, right? So people even argue about what that number is because it's just so ridiculous, but (laughs) it doesn't matter because it doesn't fit in you anyway. You can't have, because each B cell, (laughs) each B cell does one of these rearrangements and you don't have 10 to the 16 B cells. So in your body, there's something like in a mouse, uh, 
100 million B cells or something like that in a human, maybe uh, 10 to the 11 or something like that. Um, different uh, uh, B cells, each one of which has uh, a different antibody that it can make out of these 10 to the 16 possibilities. So you see how economical this is, right? You have three genes and you can make, uh, you know, 10 to the 16 different antibodies. Now, that isn't even enough because there are a lot more uh, um, structures in that. And that's where uh, our work comes in and, and the things we are interested in. Uh, usually, if you take a protein like, uh, you know, chicken egg albumin, immunologists do these weird things. We like to <laughs> use antigens that are easy to get. So one of the easiest proteins to get is chicken egg albumin. You just take it from an egg. Um, if you throw that into someone or into an animal with an adjuvant, you will make, uh, you will have to pick between the, the 100 million B cells that the mouse has, one that can bind to that. And it turns out that usually when you do that, the, cell, the cells that you pick can bind to a albumin, but not that well. So they're, they're good enough. They, if they make an antibody, this antibody wouldn't bind with the super binding affinities that you need, for example, to neutralize a virus. But what this interaction does is it calls this B cell into uh, the structure called the germinal center, which uh, is something like a boot camp uh, for B cells. And it's a ruthless uh, boot camp. I, I was talking to <laughs> Kathy Wu uh, at, the, at the Atlantic for a story, and, and she, she called it the, the B cell squid game. <laughs> oh, that's great. So yeah, that's a good analogy. That's true. It's something like that. So, so, so basically, very, very right, Darwinian. A bunch yeah. of cells. So, so yeah, a bunch of cells that um, are not that great go into this germinal center, and they start really a Darwinian process. There, they 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 introduce they use this enzyme called AID to introduce random mutations into the genome of the cell right at where the antibody gene is. Now, these are random, so uh, when you do that, um, what happens is you mess with the binding properties. So you're mo much more likely to make it worse, right? If you mess with something without knowing what you're doing, you're more likely to, to break it than fix it. But you do this enough times and then uh, that you create a population of which most cells are worse binders or just as bad as they were, but a few are actually pretty good. And now because the antigen that started the germinal center, the protein that you're targeting, like the chicken egg white, is still present in the structure, all the B cells can go there and test the antibodies they made against this protein. And there's a system, which we're all trying to figure out still, that picks out the best ones, uh, kills the worst ones, and makes the best ones go through this process again. Have a bunch of children again, each one has a different mutation, and you repeat this and you know, rinse and repeat. And uh, you end up with, after 10, 20 rounds of this, with antibodies that are really much, much better uh, than what they started with. And, and we can routinely in the lab get antibodies that are a thousand times better uh, than what they started. And that process uh, superimposed upon this random generation of diversity is what allows the body to make great antibodies to almost anything uh, that you throw in there. Right. So you have this first level of control where you have VDG recombination happening. Now it's going to happen stochastically without the antibodies going to the germinal center to be selected for. And that's important. So, so the binding at that step, that, that there's, that it's going to play a role in the response. But then the ability of those cells to actually migrate from that primary site to secondary lymphoid tissue, then that's your second site where affinity maturation can happen depending on what antigen, how long is it sticking in the journal center? And so it is this question, what you're trying to figure out is, okay, why this antigen over another? And, and how do the B cells decide uh, to bind to, to with, with that affinity, uh, you know, a short peptide over the larger protein, for instance? Right, right. Something yeah. like that. We, we divide the work in the lab into two uh, major areas. One is... Um, what we call germinal center mechanics. And, and we think of it like, uh, you know, given that this germinal center is doing this Darwinian evolution in real time, um, how does it do it? How does a, a, a clump of cells uh, manage to recapitulate Darwinian evolution inside your tonsil every day? Right. And the second one, and so this is more defined, it's sort of 
uh, evolutionary genetics. One cell's better, the other one's worse. How, how, how did they know that? The other one is a broader question, which is uh, we call clonal dynamics, which is the second thing uh, you mentioned, which uh, deals with what, how does the germinal center choose what it's going to target? Right, so, so there are many epitopes or many bits of an antigen that, that uh, an antibody can recognize. How does the B cell prioritize one over the other? How does it prioritize one antigen, like the S protein, over another, like the N protein, for example? How does it decide if it's going to make 100 different antibodies or five? Uh, which, and all these things are very important. If you make only one antibody, it's very easy for a virus to escape from it. If you make 20, it's, it's somewhat harder. If you make 100, uh, it's much harder. Um, and, and this second part, clonal dynamics, is, is much more fuzzy. It's much harder to study than, than the other part, which is, is sort of more defined. When you think about clonal dynamics, do you also uh, think about things like how long the antigen is there or how long this whole process takes? Um, that, I think, to me, is really fascinating of kind of the when pieces of all of this. Yeah, yeah. The, the germinal centers are, are very interesting. They can last from a very short time, depending on how you make them. If the, the normal experimental germinal centers we use in mice last for a couple of weeks. But they can also last very long. Like if you infect a mouse with influenza, the germinal centers just seem to go on forever. And there are some really cool papers from um, Ali Alibedi's lab now showing that when you immunize someone with a SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine, you make these germinal centers that just keep going hmm. you know, for months. Um, and uh, we're trying to understand this. One of, one of the things I, I just finished now uh, working, finished the last dot on a manuscript on, on what happens in these very long germinal centers that, uh, that uh, arise when the mouse gets infected with influenza, for example. And, and so we, we there, don't know that much about it. If there is a germinal center, does that mean there's still some antigen in it? Um, well, a priori, uh, I'd say yes. Uh, it's hard to tell. It's very hard to measure the, the amounts of antigen that the B cells care about. Um, uh, the, the gist of this paper that we are working on uh, in influenza says that the germinal centers last for six months, but the cells that were there in the beginning that are specific for the influenza antigens are actually replaced over time with something else hmm. that we don't know the, the ontogeny of. And, and when you get to the end, to the six months time point, mostly the germinal center is devoid of, of B cells that recognize the antigen. But the few cells that are still there um, seem to be very good binders. So I, I'd assume there's some antigen there. Um, and and to, to be honest, uh, uh, interest in these kinds of things like long-lived uh, germinal centers has been very, there has been very little work on this uh, mm -hmm. over time. So there's not a whole lot we, we know or a whole lot I can uh, tell you about what happens. Is that because the, the limitations of the mouse model not having as long-lasting or... We need humans to study this. Is that it? Could be, yeah, it could be. There, the, the the humans and the primates also. Sh uh, Shane right. has has a paper in BioArchive now, showing that in primates you can get the same if you immunize them just right. Um, it could be that the mouse is not a good model for for these very long lived long lived germinal centers. It could also be that that um, uh, the, the time frames are different. So mm -hmm. six months for a mouse is a quarter of the mouse's life. Right. Um, Right. And how, how the, the time scale, so that the mouse seems to mutate faster than a human, uh, accumulate mutations faster than a human, for example. So it's hard to compare these things. But, but you were um, able um, to develop technology in mice to, to start to answer these questions. And I think it was a 2016 paper where you really laid out some of these technologies. Can you share with us what those are and, and some of the questions you're able to address? Right, right. That was, uh, that was actually our first effort into this field of clonal dynamics. Um, the, let me see how I can start. Well, <laughs> there, so at the time we started that, there was very, very little about what was the clonal diversity within one of those structures. And people thought it was very simple because there were a few papers out there that said it's something like three clones. So one germinal center has something like 2,000 cells in a mouse. Uh, in a mouse uh, immunization-induced terminal center. They, they have a wide variety of sizes. But, uh, and the papers that were around said it's only three clones in there. So mostly cells would be competing within their clone 
for, for the highest affinity. And the competition between clones may or may not be uh, important. And that was sort of, so those dynamics were ignored, uh, I think, for, for a very long time. Um, we got into this because we were looking at competition. This is something I did during my PhD here at Rockefeller. I was looking at competition between cells uh, as the attempt to get into the germinal center. So we knew that there were many clones that were recruited by antigen, but we thought there must be a very strong bottleneck that limits that so that you get only three in each germinal center. And when we started measuring that wa- bottleneck, we found it. We, we, we saw it was there, but it didn't look too strong. It didn't look strong enough to, to restrict it to the three best. Um, so what we did was uh, I took one of these techniques, something I had come up with as a grad student um, that is a... Uh, we use a lot still in the lab, which is a photoactivatable mouse. Uh, we we uh, knocked in, we engineered into a mouse um, a gene uh, from um, a, a variant of green, green fluorescent protein that is photoactivatable, which means it doesn't fluoresce in the normal green conditions unless you pre-illuminate it with the light. And then it turns that on and it keeps that on. Like, why is this important? So a germinal center has something like 10 sorry, a lymph node has about 10 germinal centers in it. If you want to look at what the clones are in these germinal centers, you mash them up and you put them in a fax tube and then you sort them out. But then you're going to get the jumbled up 10 germinal centers and you're not going to be able to see just one. Now, if you have a mouse that has this protein, you can take a laser, you can shine it on one of the germinal centers on a microscope, and then that, that germinal center turns green. So if you put that lymph node on a sorter, you get only the green ones. Uh, and so you know they came from only one germinal center. So after we made that mouse, we use it for something else initially. But then, you know, we had this sort of idea that you could use that to count. So what we did was, we did exactly that. We took a germinal center right at the time that it, that it formed, and we counted how many clones were in there. And to our surprise, almost every single cell that we got from that germinal center was a different clone. And we, and then we started thinking, well, this, this is not quite right. We use some, some equations from ecology. So this is sort of an ecological problem I put in t- t- to just uh, sort of extrapolate from the numbers we had, what was the diversity in a germinal center? And it turned out to be something like 100 clones. Um, so so can germ- I just ask, ask a question to clarify? Um, so when you say the original idea was that there were three clones per germinal center, um, is that three clones for a particular antigen or just three clones total? Three clones total. Hmm. These okay. experiments and were done with single antigens mostly. Okay. Mm. And so then, so it's not, so basically like a germinal center is responding to 20 antigens, sorry, no, 60 antigens, 20 germinal centers times three clones. And you're realizing, no, it's more like a hundred per. Per germ, yeah. So something yeah, okay. like, like several That's, hundred or a thousand. That's awesome. Of cells. So that, so the effect that that had on us was it it shifted our thoughts from this germinal center mechanics, like this Darwinian thing, you know, two clones that are the same but made different mutations and are competing, to a mixture of this thing going on at the same time that all sorts of different clones are competing against each other, and that's the dominant form because you have a hundred clones competing. So it's more like a, a slide that I use in my lectures. There's a couple of giraffes reaching up for for leaves, uh, the very prototypical Darwinian Lamarckian uh, 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 analogy, and and they say, well, that's that's happening for sure, but th- that's happening within the second slide is this water hole with with a hundred different animals, uh, including a giraffe in the middle, and the, the it's it's a much more complex uh, issue what's actually going on in real life because there are different clones with slightly different incentives. They might bind different epitopes, they might bind the same epitope, they might bind different antigens, and somehow the germinal center is solving this equation. Um, but but the focus should be, I think, on these, um, at least some of the focus should be on, on this interclonal competition between the different specificities. Um, so... Uh, the second thing we, we did in this paper was we, we decided we wanted to study how this evolves over time, but we also thought this is way too hard. If we're going to do this at different time points and we're going to try to estimate how many different journal, how many different clones there are by sequencing, at that time this was pretty expensive. And yeah, you were just uh, doing that by sequencing, right? So you were sorting these out by flow cytometry and then doing sequencing and finding how many different sequences you were getting. That's how you were determining there was 
all these different clones versus three? Is that how you were yeah, doing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, Sanger sequence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know. So your Fast original lab. interest in, in bioengineering came back, right? Because you wanted to me- use something clever <laughs> to make it life easier on yourself, right? Yeah, I was thinking, can we make this simpler on ourselves? And we, we kind of got a shortcut to it, which was this uh, really cool mouse that um, Jeff Lickman, a uh, neuroscientist from Harvard, had made, which was called the Brainbow. Yep. Mm-hmm. I know if you guys know that, uh, yep. seen the original paper, they were beautiful <laughs> images there. Yeah. Yeah, spectacular. And basically, this is a mouse where, where when you turn on this recombinase, this enzyme, Cree, which you can do in several different ways in the mouse, each cell picks a color. And it can pick between a variety of different colors, depending on the mouse you use. So in the original paper, I think they could pick between you know, a, several dozen colors. And what it did was, because you had a brain full of neurons, and each one picked a different color, and you had these beautiful things looked like uh, looked like uh, impressionist art, where... <laughs> where you saw the neuron bodies and these axons. And the cool thing is that if a cell divides and has two daughters, it's gonna, the daughters are going to keep the color of the mother. And we thought, okay, this is really what we need for germinal centers because um, if you have 100 clones and each one is a different color, and then there is a strong selection event, like a clonal sweep, where, where one clone just starts dividing and takes over the whole thing, you're going to see a germinal center that's multicolored turn into something that's single colored. And with that, without any sequencing, just by looking at it, we are going to be able to t- tell you something about how this evolution works. So we couldn't do this immediately. It took a while before people made the mice that uh, were necessary. Uh, so Hans Klavers made a, a, a version of Bramo called Confetti that was ideal for what we wanted to do. Then there was another mouse that was made by Jean-Claude Vial and Claude Agnès Renaud in uh, Paris that um, had this AID enzyme, the enzyme that makes the mutations in the B cell drive the recombinase that made the cells pick a color. So we put these two mice together and then we, we finally could do this and and the pictures are, are pretty cool. You, you give this recombinase, you have a lymph node, there are a bunch of germinal centers, they're all different colors. Um, and if you wait a couple of weeks and look at it, you'll see that some of the germinal centers now are only one color. And that indicates that that one of the cells was able to take over the whole ensemble. Uh, so it's like, you know, the, 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 the zebra was over, able to win over the, the water hole and now they're only zebras. <laughs> <laughs> you use and, another uh, trick though, because you could use uh, a time dependent activation of this event. So you could track this kinetically, right? Right, right. So we used um, this drug called tamoxifen, which, which is known for its uh, activity against breast cancer. But you can engineer mice to make uh, this Cre recombinase dependent on having tamoxifen in the system. So when you give tamoxifen to the mouse, uh, that's when the cells pick a color. So you can make them pick a color whenever you want. And then ask, are these germinal centers still selected? And, and we, we saw that, that it was actually pretty rare that a germinal center would do this, become single colored over time. Mm-hmm. But when they did this, we identified this phenomenon, we started calling it clonal burst, which is really what it sounds like. It's one cell that gets a really strong selection signal, proliferates enough to kick out everybody else, basically, in the germinal center. We still don't really understand how the cells do this, but they proliferate so much that they take over a 2,000 cell ensemble in, in a matter of a few days. So that was, it's related to my question about the organizational structure So, and how the cells moved. Do you think that it's chemokine, cytokine dependent? Why these are the, you know, are high affinity B cells secreting more of, I don't know, you know, IL-2 or whatever they're secreting to give signals that, okay, they are the dominant clone, that they're able to better, you know, like what, why one, one lymph node has five germinal centers and one has 10. Yeah. Mm. Is it chemokine dependent that allows the cells to actually migrate there? You know, like CYP1, for example. Yeah. So, so there are a lot of, a lot of issues in there. There, there, the first one, I think one of the important ones is why are there certain number of germinal centers? And this is because there are different, uh, stromal cells in the lymph node called follicular dendritic cells that secrete mm-hmm. a chemokine CXCL13. Right. And because they're patchy, they sort of uh, attract patches of B cell that we call the B cell follicles around them. 
And, and a lot of this work was done by Jason Sisters at uh, UCSF who figured out a lot of this. There are many different factors, uh, including CXCL13, but also S1PR2 is a, is a receptor for a single lipid, and also uh, other um, um, receptors that are important that, that really constrain the B cells to one single germinal center. So uh, as when we look, we see that that the, the the germinal center B cells don't leave their own germinal center. So sometimes we use the brain going, we see that there's a red germinal center here and a blue germinal center here. And this one's completely red, this one's completely blue, which means the cells, the B cells are not um, interchanging between them at any appreciable rate. And this kind of allows them, again, going back to the Darwinian analogy, to behave like these evolutionary islands. Uh, where you can make one clone that's great and takes over the entire germinal center, but that's not going to be at the expense of ridding the response of every other clone it has because that island might be dominated by one clone and the one right next to it might be still very diverse. So uh, in a way, you prevent something like an, an infectious clone uh, from taking over the whole response <clears throat> and leading to a monoclonal product at the end, mm -hmm. which, which I... I presume would be bad because it would be easy to escape from. Right. When you look at these patterns of different dynamics um, of the germinal centers, do you see the same sort of thing in uh, different lymph nodes or do different lymph nodes sort of have different patterns? Mm, that, that's interesting. I let me, let me see if this answers it. We, we have looked extensively at mesenteric lymph nodes. Is, is that where where you're going? Yeah, or, yeah or? I, I just meant sort of, you know, does a mesenteric lymph node sort of do something fundamentally different than, say, uh, right, right. an axillary or the, a spleen or something like that? Right. right. Um, so the mesenterics are super interesting because they drain the gut. And the gut has food antigens and it has antigens from commensals. And there are... Um, uh, sort of, I don't know, hundreds of species of commensals in your gut, and each one of them has got, got to have thousands of antigens. So these germinal centers are potentially responding to hundreds of thousands of different antigens, right? It's probably less than that because of trafficking. But still a lot, right? And you're telling a, an ensemble that is com to, that contains hundreds of B cells of different specificities to respond against hundreds of different antigens or thousands of different antigens, and you're asking it, solve this equation and come up with a winner. And guess what? They do it. So some germinal centers that are draining the gut, and this was another paper that we had a couple of years ago, now um, uh, actually find a solution, a unique solution, and they become dominated by one clone. So uh, it seems like the germinal centers are just so wired to do this competition that even when, when they're not really supposed to, um, they, they, they still do it. Um, so we're, we're, we, we see in these germinal centers that they are finding antigens from bacteria, commensal bacteria, and doing affinity maturation against them, even in the middle of, of all this competition. And this is something we, uh, we are, uh, trying to work out. There's a, a, a lot of, uh, interest in our lab and also in our, uh, Carla Noasad, who is a, a postdoc in lab who did this work, who's now a, a PI at NYU, uh, who's working on, on these questions. So then using your mouse model, using the brain mice, taking it into your next question, and it was interesting, this paper, you know, you hypothesized something that I'll let you introduce, but then really found kind of the opposite of what you expected, which I love in science. Like I love that type of story where, where you know, it's, it's also good for the audience to know like that science is not linear. It actually, uh, a lot of times we're proving ourselves wrong and then we're circling back. So um, what, what was that hypothesis in relation to memory B cells germinal mm -hmm. center? Right. So, so I, I, I guess I have to talk about memory a little bit before there. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds good. When, when you, you drive immune cells, B cells through a germinal center, some of the cells become plasma cells and go straight away to start secreting antibody because that's the antibody that's in the serum that will protect you. Um, but some of the, the cells in there uh, exit back into quiescence and they go back to looking very much like they were before they went into the germinal center. They stop dividing, they're just quietly migrating around the body. 
Uh, but and but there are many of them, and they are now very good at recognizing the antidote, right? And these are called uh, uh, memory B cells. And the reason they're around is that if you see this antigen again, they are very good at expanding and making uh, plasma cells again uh, very efficiently. And this is sort of you know part of the cellular component of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine response that people talk about. There's the the antibodies you have in serum, but there's also the cells that are ready to respond again if you if you get infected again. And that's why that helps your second uh, your your breakthrough infection be less severe. For example, right now, um, it's very hard in the literature. It's very hard to tease things apart. But the the impression we had looking at it, and I think from first principles, what you would deduce is that uh, if you try to make a germinal center again against the same antigen, the B cells that would go to this germinal center would be the memory cells, and they would go there again and they would mutate again, and they would become even better. And if you come now with an Omicron variant, those cells would go in again, and they would mutate again to be better at Omicron. And if you came in with the Omega variant uh, in a couple of years, <laughs> you know, they would do that again, right? Uh, I hope not. But, uh, <laughs> Knock on wood there. <laughs> right? But the idea was that your secondary germinal center would be composed of these memory cells because they were so much better and so much expanded. So what we set out to do is say, let's do Brainbow on the secondary germinal centers we, we and look to see uh, if there are many clones going in, if there are few clones going in, how did they compete with each other, if the germinal centers have many colors or few colors. Uh, so we did this experiment. We took a mouse, we immunized it in one foot with, uh, it could be anything, a, a, a model antigen like a chicken, egg um, antibodies, or an influenza hemagglutinin. We started these germinal centers, we made them pick colors, and, re and do the, the rainbow thing the way they do. A month later, we came back to the same mouse and we uh, immunized it in the other foot. Say, okay, we're going to call all the memory from one foot. It's going to go end up in the other and they're going to fight it out. <laughs> and what we ended up seeing was that over and over, it didn't matter how we did this, what time we did it, what antigen we did it, what adjuvant we did it. Most of the cells in the secondary germinal centers had never been in the germinal center before. So they were either naive B cells or they were a type of memory cell that looks very much like naive. Now, we, we've done a lot more experiments since that paper uh, came out, and we're pretty sure that they're actually naive cells, not some mm, sort of okay. pre-germinal center memory. Um, and we thought, okay, this is odd. This uh, We weren't expecting this because naive cells, why are naive cells uh, doing this? There are fewer of them that are antigen-specific because they haven't been expanded, and they're worse uh, because they haven't been uh, affinity matured. But consistently, about 95% of the cells in the general center were naive. This doesn't mean that cells never re-enter, right? We could go there uh, and find cells that did re-enter um, and continue to evolve. So, so the paradigm that cells could evolve over and over is certainly true, but it just represents a, a tiny fraction of, wow. of what these general centers are doing uh, in the mice. So, so we went. Uh, back into different models and we looked at memory B cells and influenza and things like that. One, one advantage of influenza is that you have very good reagents uh, that are tetramers, we call them, that are the influenza uh, surface antigen clumped up into groups of four. And they, if you have a B cell that's specific for influenza, this, this thing is going to stick to it. And if you put a fluor fluorescent molecule on it, you can identify these, these cells pretty easily. So we had access to the memory that was made after influenza and we found that if you immunize one foot of the mouse or if you infect it with influenza, you make a ton of memory. Um, there are uh, hundreds, if not more, different clones of memory that are influenza-specific that were made in this response. So the problem is the real bottleneck comes at the boost. So when you go to the other foot pad and you boost the other foot pad uh, of the mouse, you'll see that something like the five or six clones dominate the whole response. And they're picked from among the very best of those memory cells. So you have this huge amount of memory that just seems to sit there and, and not respond, uh, reproduce or not respond detectably uh, to the boost. On the other hand, the few clones that respond, they respond like, like maniacs. You get a huge number of plasma cells uh, that are derived from the, this first response. They go to the bone marrow, you can track them all around the mouse, and they make very high titers of antibodies. And those were highly mutated, so we're they're the high affinity, high binders. They they, they tend to span the whole range of mutations of that oh. particular clone. 
Wow. So you pick five clones. From within these clones, you pick the whole range of them, from the okay. low mutated to the high mutated. So it Got seems it. more like, like how good the cell was to start with. So that's crazy. I know this concept of germline encoded, and you can get into that, but like what your germline is encoding and, and its ability to recognize the antigen or whatever that first response at the beginning is predicting how, which, how, which clone is making it to the germinal center amongst yeah. these this small number of clones. That's what that that those that paper suggests. There, yeah. there, I think we need we need quite a bit more work to, yeah. to really nail down and be able to claim what you what, what you just said. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's certainly that's what that paper indicates. And so the bottleneck is no longer what what was maybe traditionally predicted, where the bottleneck was that you wouldn't have this diverse germinal center in the beginning. That's but the, but the, the bottleneck is happening in the secondary response. That boost. seems to be the case. Yeah. So the bottleneck is strong. It's just not where we. Yeah. Right. Um, we thought it was. Yeah. So. Okay. So, so with the the point that Steph was making a second ago about those original cells specificity, um, determining kind of some of the details of what happens to them, could that just be due to things like strength of signal or um, other details of the exact signal that those cells get in the very first encounter with antigen? Right, either in the very first encounter with antigen or in the very first encounter with T cells, right? Uh, which right. are the two, the two um, uh, sort of you know the, the double key that needs to be turned to uh, unleash the, the the B cell, right? So, um, so it really um, designing antigen design is is going. I mean, to, to really target these clones that are going to mobilize to the germinal center to, I guess, what you're saying, they may not necessarily become high affinity because they they do span the range of the amount of mutations, but then the high affinity will be selected. So antigen... Well, they, they, are in, they have in common that they're pretty high affinity to start with. Okay, okay. So it is in, still in the, the ones. where we looked. Yeah. Got it, got it. Okay. So, so you make a thousand clones randomly that can bind to your antigen enough to be recruited to a germinal center. But there's the tip of the pyramid there. The, there are the ones that are good to start with. Right. These tend to dominate the response and tend to become much better and tend to really dominate the, the recall response. That, so you have all these unused memory cells just hanging out. <laughs> right, know. right. We, that's what we call them, yeah, unused yeah. memory. Um, <laughs> unused just means it wasn't, wasn't used. We don't know that they have, they're intrinsically different. Right. But, but, uh, but, you know, one possibility is that that's a reservoir of memory cells that can then be uh, mobilized when when you see a different antigen with different um, uh, sort sort of a variant antigen that doesn't trigger your your big uh, winner clones, but uh, because it mutated at that at those immunodominant positions, yeah. it could still bring in some of that um, diverse memory. So the question is whether uh, this hierarchy of memory would change if uh, with different. Um, booster uh, uh, strategies. And, and this is where we think um, it might be interesting to think about in intervening. If, if there are ways to boost differently that could uh, mobilize more of this, this response or, or maybe favor the entry of memory cells into germinal centers, that would be uh, a good thing to do. Yeah. So are there, I guess, different outcomes or reasons why we why you might want to have more memory cells going into that germinal center after boost versus mm. naive cells. I'm I'm still very su surprised by the naive cells <laughs> um, going into the secondary germinal center um, and trying to wrap my mind around that. And so I guess, what's the functional consequence and right. why might we want one outcome versus the other? Yeah, like what's the point, germinal okay. center? Why, you, why all these naive <laughs> let me, cells? Let me... <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we want to do in humans, but first let me let me um, qualify this with uh, with the caveat that these data are are, are true in the mouse. Okay? Mm -hmm. Whatever whatever we have done in mice shows us this. There there is basically we've tried a lot. There's no way we know of of, of making a secondary germinal center in mice that is mostly uh, consisted of memory cells if you do it at a distal site. Um, in humans, the the story is less clear. There there are there was one paper again by Ali Alabedi who has been really doing great work. We should have him on next. I we think. should, yeah. It, it's <laughs> uh, it's it's cool what he does. He he developed these 
clinical protocols to immunize people hmm. uh, with the, initially with a flu vaccine and now with SARS-CoV-2 and to then um, sample their lymph nodes using fine needle aspirates, which is something you would do, for example, to diagnose a, a cancer. And um, he will then poke these germinal centers and get some cells out, and then you can actually have access to what's going on in the human the germinal center system. And he immunized in this paper three uh, volunteers with influenza vaccine, and that's important. And he picked out the germinal centers, and he found that they have a big range of cells that he could somehow attribute to memory based on their number of mutations. And so one of the uh, patients had something like 5% that looked kind of like our mice, and another one had more than half, uh, wow. uh, which looked very different from the mice. Now, we, uh, we don't know if this is biology or history, right? Because uh, it could be that mice and human have different B cell biology and that mice are much more resistant to putting memory cells into their secondary journal centers. Um, it could also be history. Uh, influenza is a particularly tricky model because people have been in, immunized against this uh, and infected with this multiple times in life and you build up right. memory over time, right? So if at some point, you have 1% of all your B cells are influenza memory, which has been seen in, in some studies, you'd have a lot more that you're trying to put into that germinal center. And then and, and it, it wouldn't be a, a, a biological difference. It would be a historical difference, right? Yeah. Now, okay, with that caveat, um, I think that uh, the main question that we had in mind when we started doing these studies was this idea, and Stephanie knows very well, about this, about uh, trying to sequentially immunize um, to make high uh, affinity antibodies against, uh, sorry, broadly, neutralize, broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV. Hmm. So HIV needs these super antibodies in order for a vaccine to work. They have to be, they have to have a hundred mutations or something uh, in the two chains combined. Uh, they have to have gone through a lot of affinity maturation. They're very rare. And one of the ideas is that you could make them do that by immunizing with one thing, doing a germinal center, then immunizing again, calling these cells again to another germinal center, shaping them a little bit more, changing to a third antigen, calling them back again. So you'd call them back to the germinal center five times in a row until they are the cell you need. Right? And these mice data say that that is going to be hard to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one of the main uh, caveats of not allowing memory into secondary germinal centers is that you tend to um, you tend to uh, not be able to remodel things that are already modeled. So your, your SARS-CoV-2 specific memory is not going to be adaptable to Omicron. You're going to have to make a new, a new set of memory, okay? if, if, that, if that is all true. Um, turns out that there is a, is a way, it seems, to, to be able to do that, which is just avoid recalling these cells and keep just hitting the same germinal center over and over, uh, uh, never let the cells out and refuel them. If uh, they get there, right? I mean, we have to assume right. that they've that they've made it to the journal, that that's one of the three clones that are there. Right, right. And then and hit it, can, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. But um, so as an immediately uh, useful thing about this is, is that it suggests that maybe the best way to achieve this sequential immunization is not to recall cells from memory over and over. It's just to, to bring them in once and keep them there and yeah. keep hitting them in the same spot. Um, an advantage of having a naive response is that it goes against uh, phenomena like uh, original antigenic sin, right? So if, if you kept just using the same cells over and over, you would fall into original antigenic sin, which means you always use the same cells and you can't make antibodies to new epitopes as long as an old epitope is still there. Uh, this new uh, admitting naive cells to germinal centers has the advantage of counteracting that. Uh, and that's something that we're trying to investigate in the lab a lot, trying to understand how affinity, uh, how, how germinal center reentry and um, um, original antigenic sin play along. So I, I actually have two questions. So one is... You, you're, you're saying that there's some things that are similar in human and some that are different from, from what you can tell from these initial experiments that the other individual is doing. Um, but how does, how does the, you know, environment, so in other words, we keep mice really clean, 
basically. Like we're SPF, right? So they have they have commensals, right. but they really don't have much else. So when they're getting exposed the first time, it's they're pretty well they're pretty naive. So the right. responses right. we're looking at are going to be quite different than when you're in a human, where you're continuously exposed to lots of different things, presumably on a daily basis that we're generating mm-hmm. immune responses to. And so, how does that influence this whole outcome? Right. I, I think of that as as both a feature and a bug, right? Um, it's a bug in the sense that uh, some things don't work in the same way as they would in a human because the mice are too clean. So one example, I don't remember what it was. It was mice that were from the wild or pet shop or something like that, responded very differently to anti-CD28 compared to mice that were clean. Mm-hmm. And the uh, dirty mice responded more closely to what humans do. Right. And, and if you remember, anti-CD28 was a terrible uh, miss, uh, yep. a, a terrible failure of human trials where a patient died from from getting it, um, yep. from results that were unanticipated in mice. Right? Yep. And mm-hmm. so, so that's the, the bug part. It, uh, you're not mimicking what happens in a human because a human has a lot of exposure. The feature part is that you're not confounded by history as mm-hmm. I, in the, in the malls that I was just telling them. I right. know that when I give my mouse influenza, it's never seen it before. Yep. So I can go from a blank slate and ask, what is the basic, what are the basic principles operating here uh, in this system um, without much risk of, for example, cross-reactivity between my influenza and some other mouse virus or, or some bacterial product or, or, or anything else. Right. Or... Also, when I induce a germinal center, the germinal center, the lymph node where it started is empty because this mouse has not been exposed to many other things. So I'm creating a germinal center in a B cell follicle that didn't have one before, mm-hmm. which is not always the case in, right. in, in mice that are dirty. So, I mean, it's not a matter of either or. I think it's a matter of what do you want it for? And, and there are studies where you want to mimic closely humans where dirty mice are going to be a, a better thing, better model. But uh, in other cases, when you want to go down to the basics, you want to avoid uh, all prior reactivity. You might want to, to stick with the cleanest mice you can get. Yeah, that's fair. So, I mean, you could re- you could re-derive your your mice, and you can look at T cell responses that are specific to ovalbumin. So the mice could be dirty, but they've never seen that antigen. So there's some things you could do that way. But the the other question I had was related to T dependent and T independent antigens. Do do these same right, things yeah. apply for the generation of memory, and and whether these naive cells go into the germinal centers, yeah. or are there different that's, uh, different rules? That's interesting. Yeah, I, it's interesting because just now today I saw a paper by Hai Chi, uh, a germinal center scientist and, and uh, a B cell biologist who's, who's in uh, uh, Beijing at, uh, um, at Tsinghua. And he said uh, something about how T independent germinal centers happen and they are important and they, they do things to uh, cells that are germinal center dependent. They imprint them with a memory. Kind of thing, and this has a long history. There, are, I, as far as I can remember, there are, there are three papers on this, uh, but they are spaced uh, many years apart. There's something from Carola Vinuesa, her PhD work actually um, in Ian McLennan's lab that, that says that you can make if you really force the system in a mouse that's monoclonal with a high affinity ligand, you can make beautiful T-independent germinal centers. They just don't last very long. They 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 crash very quickly. Then there was another paper from Michelle uh, Newsom's white lab from a PhD student before I got there who that says that, yeah, you can detect T-independent memory. If you give a T-independent antigen and you wait a while and you boost the mice, you'll see a response that's bigger than what you saw before. So there must hmm. be something. And then there was this paper from Hai. I, I read the abstract and, and uh, today I didn't have access to the paper at the time. Oh, no. I have to read it. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I think there are... I'm I, I'm pretty sure that it's not comparable in magnitude to the T dependent response, uh, and there are probably certain isotypes like IgG one and and two C that are restricted to T dependent responses. But uh, there, it's not nothing. It seems like there is a, a some uh, remembrance of 
of antigens passed in, um, uh, without help from T cells. Can you explain um, from a viewpoint of a germinal center then why for some antigens you need to give multiple doses? What is the reason for that? Mm -hmm. I always thought of uh, the first dose as the one that makes the germinal centers and the affinity maturation. And the other doses as really what they are, boosters. They take memory and turn memory into plasma cells. So memory cells becoming plasma cells, that's a very efficient process. They're all pre-programmed to do that. Okay. So your titers, when they go up by the boost, that's memory straight to plasma cell. Okay. Uh, in high amounts. And um, now, there's one thing that, that surprised me in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, whole issue of the, of the vaccine. And you know, Pete, you've had this debate many times, is that um, the two doses are very close to each other, right, in the protocols we use. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that's too close. And the reason why is that by three weeks, you haven't made the memory that you'd want to boost I see. with the third, right? So, okay. So it's kind of useless, but it, it, it actually isn't because what we see, I think, in, in, in the papers that are coming out is that the booster hits the same germinal center as the prime and makes it into a super germinal center huh. that stays on for a long time, makes really good memory. And then when your third dose comes in, you harvest that really good memory and you wow. throw it into the plasma cell compartment. And that is, I think, why the booster has been uh, so important. You're, you're so having sort of a, a double prime. The booster appears to also continue affinity maturation, so you get a broader neutralization response, right? It encompasses more variants mm -hmm. than after the second dose. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not sure that that's what's happening because um, remember that what you have in serum before the boost is what made it in the first, the, the plasma cells that are coming straight out of the germinal center. And after the th third boost, you bring in the memory, hmm. right? So it's hard to say whether the broadening comes from re-affinity maturation okay. of the memory or it comes from just harvesting a lot of the memory that was sitting there but was not in the serum at that point. Let's Got say that the memory cells in serum are derived from your second boost and they are three week old memory cells plus whatever came out of the germinal center over time. The germinal center cells after your boost are, are six-month-old, eight-month-old uh, cells that have been maturing a lot. And, and, and I think one way that, that viruses uh, escape is by making mutations that, that block certain antibodies from binding, but that's because the antibodies don't have a large, high-affinity surface. And that better antibodies with higher, larger, higher-affinity surfaces against the antigen are harder to knock off with one mutation. So, so, so am I understanding this correctly, um, that you think that the broadening is not necessarily happening because you're getting, you know, additional um, affinity maturation um, with that third antigen delivery. It's actually that you are harnessing more of the unused memory cells hmm. that you did not harness before. Is that what you're saying? I would, I would think so. And especially because these things are being assayed a week after the boost or two weeks after yeah. the boost. Yeah. There hasn't been a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so, so what is the effect of multiple? So many countries now, or some countries, are going to fourth and fifth and sixth. I mean, what's happening after each of these additional boosters? What are they I, doing? I, I think we're in uh, no person's <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we, that, we don't okay. we don't know. I, I I can I can speculate up to the third. I can't speculate more than that. <laughs> but is beyond the third going to give you continue affinity maturation, or not just? Recall of uh, memory and production of antibodies. Uh, uh, extrapolating from mice, there will be some uh, continued affinity maturation, but mostly you're going to be recruiting new things. But okay. again, we need to we need the data in human. It could be that at that point, the more memory you have, the more likely you are to recruit this memory into terminal centers and make them better. So, okay. um, hmm. I think this has to be determined empirically. I, I, I have no prediction. So your concept of a super germinal center. So that would then argue, like in HIV vaccine trials, that you would want the first two to be close together and then the boost to be farther 
apart and not maybe these mm-hmm. kind of like equidistant four weeks, four weeks, four weeks. Are there other examples? Like maybe describe to me more this concept of the super germinal center and what does okay, that mean? I, I would say if, if you want to do this sequential thing, I would make sure the vaccines are given before the germinal center goes away. Yeah. The doses. And then after the whole thing is done, come back a year later, give a mm-hmm. boost, and that's going to harvest the product of your efforts. Because unlike what, so what you had done in your paper was really trying to look at de novo B cell, um, naive B cells, you know, and trying to determine like you, you, and that's why you did the different foot pads because you didn't want to potentially recall cells that may be left over from the one lymph node on the one side right. of the animal. And we and see so, that effect. Um, if, right. if you boost the same side, there's certainly, there's not a hundred percent of the dermal center's memory, but certainly quite a bit more than if you do it on the other side. Um, it does, go, and that does argue for using your same arm <laughs> for vaccination, correct? I, I, I do not want to give uh, medical advice. <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> Based on mice. Um, yes, yes. But yeah. um, Garnet uh, okay. Kelso actually had a, a preprint just uh, yeah. uh, published now where he, he sees the same thing as we do. and he But he argues that the, uh, the effect you see on the same side is... is maybe not all refueling or not refueling mm-hmm. at all, but also maybe some local memory that, that is generated and never leaves the lymph He's just so down the hall some, for me, so maybe I'll yeah. go chat with him about that. Go ask him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there could be some more uh, 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 subtleties there that we're, we're not aware of. Sure. So Gabriel, if you, had, if you weren't in an emergency situation, what would be the timing after the first and the second dose? How much time should you ideally give? You're asking the me of now or the me before I knew the... No, 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 now, right now. <laughs> now, I would do exactly what what is done. I would just make sure that the first and second dose are, are on the same side. But yeah. three, four weeks is fine? Well, because it's not one prime. It's like a double prime. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. You're, you're, you're starting the germinal center and then you're hitting it again to make it. And, and mm. that is making things very interesting. But they didn't if, do if that asked. because of you. They did that, or what you know, they did that <laughs> out of expediency, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. I think they, 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 uh, you know, how do you say this in English? They, they shot at what they saw and hit mm. what they didn't see. Do you say that yeah, in yeah. English? Or is it a Brazilian? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good for kids who are now getting the three, four week spacing, even though we know it should be longer, mm-hmm. but. You're saying it's, it's okay. Right. And then of course, I'm, I'm completely ignoring the virology perspective on this, right? Which says you want to immunize quickly because you want to maximize the immunity am- among the population mm. to prevent variants from from coming up, right? So, so that was, I think, uh, an argument that, that Paul Binash had, uh, was defending very strongly, that you should not delay the first dose, even if it's better immunologically, because you need to ramp up the immunity in the population ASAP. Yeah. More of a public health implication. Yeah. So I, I have, I'll just maybe one more question um, or more if you guys have them. But so if the primary role of secondary germinal centers is to restart affinity maturation de novo rather than to refine, you know, memory B cells. So what about these vaccines, these universal vaccines, where they're really focusing on antibody responses to conserved epitopes? Would, mm-hmm. would that argue against that with this, these data? You mean uh, flu, where, where it's the, a stem vaccine, for example? On a- that or looking at, so coronavirus, you know, taking a region of the spike mm-hmm. um, that is conserved amongst multiple different Coronavirus is spanning, you know, bats. Right, right. Um, well, what, there what you might want to, now? you might want to start fresh, right? You might want to start from a naive core. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if, uh, in, in general, these these conserved epitopes are not immunodominant, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not immunodominant. They're conserved because they're not immunodominant. Because if they were immunodominant, right. they would have changed. Changed, right? okay. Gotcha. Um, so I think it's. It's uh, sometimes maybe maybe uh, easiest to start fresh, and you're not going to have a lot of competition from memory cells. And 
And I guess if you do the immunization just right, you will uh, make a good, strong stem response that isn't just going to go away the next time you get flu, which seems to right. be that. But you also said it's not exclusive. So some of those memory cells do end up going back in, right? So yeah, is it yeah. sort of a balancing act where the, 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 the first job is to get those memory cells into plasma cells and producing antibody, right? But then a, a few of them you want to try and refine it even more. But then you want to recall, you want to call in all of these other ones that are still yet naive and then try again and see. Because right, right. basically if you're seeing the pathogen again, what you had didn't quite work, right? So you want to try again with right, right. new that things. Is, uh, yeah, that's a thought uh, I think we had at the time. I kind of forgot about that angle. And you're reminding me, you know, yeah, like, like if you get something again, it might be because that you need a better, a broader um, response to it, either because you're too focused on one epitope and that thing changed it. So, so... One hypothesis we have is that there could be sort of a filling up the holes model. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you have a, a, a and this is a, this is now speculative. If you have the influenza head that is dominant over the stem, but the stem is conserved, the head is variable. You immunize with that, you're going to make antibodies to the head because the head is way immunodominant over the stem. We don't know why, but it, it just is. Um, now, if you keep hitting it, maybe your second germinal center is going to avoid the head because the head is is taken and start uh, seeing the stem. And if you do this over and over, you're going to start filling up the holes in your first response with new epitopes to the second. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and if you do that, you could end up with a, a, a broader response at the end. And, and it seems that, that people that are uh, older who've seen influenza multiple times have a, have a better uh, stem response. And How would the terminal die? center know what was taken? <laughs> right, right, right. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Come on next time and chat yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, great. We, we have some idea. Um, okay, All right, you guys. Yeah, I mean, we've, we're kind of a little bit past an hour. We don't want to keep you too long, but it, I think we could talk about this for you know hours more, but we won't do that to you. No, no, any, any other lingering <laughs> questions that anybody has? Um, I mean, I have 50, but I'll just email you or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still trying to wrap my brain around and process all of the things that I've learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, like I have to, to change question. how I think about teaching immunology. Well, but, oh, but you know, these these are all these are all works in progress, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think sure. we are still uh, grappling with all of these things, and and uh, uh, to some extent, we are also trying to understand what what are mice good for modeling and what uh, they aren't, and they're not going to be good to model every aspect mm -hmm. of human immunology, right? But they're going to be able to good to model some, and and that's where we are, uh, where our thought process is right now. What how close to humans can we get, right? How close to the sun can we get without melting our wings? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's much harder, but you can do the single cell sequencing analysis in human to try and see if some of these things right, hold yeah. true, right? The issue is things like fate mapping. That no, that you, yeah, of, you won't be right, able to do. The backbone right. of our, our mouse experiments. Um, right. I, and I do like that your evolutionary twist to your questions. It's really like, why, you know, why, why is the journalist that are doing this? Is it evolutionary beneficial? So, you, you know, if you have a huge number of high affinity clones taking up space, then you don't have room for the next infection you're going to get from a, a fungal infection or bacteria. Is that, so it, I like to think of it that way too. Yeah. I, I think things like original antigenic sin are, are very poorly understood and explained. Oh, yeah. So right. a lot of, you know, there, there might be in some sense a way that the, the, the mammalian system is evolving to cope with these kinds of, of um, uh, pressures. Which isn't as much a problem when you only live two years versus <laughs> eight, right? Well, right? I, I like to think that the, the evolution of the system preceded the choice of mice to live two years and the choice of humans to live eight years. <laughs> so let's have you finish by doing something we should have done a while ago. Just define original antigenic sin, yeah. please. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, but that, that's very difficult to define because I don't <laughs> think people agree with what it is. Well, your definition okay. is fine. Uh, I, I like to call it primary addiction instead of <laughs> original antigenic thing. And it says, uh, mostly if you keep seeing the same antigen, you're addicted to using your primary response, the primary mm-hmm. cohort of clones that you put in, which means oh. that if you introduce a new epitope, uh, it's going to be difficult to make an antibody to that one. And that's the sin yeah, part. Yeah. Got it. So the sin part is you are prevented from making antibodies to new things because you have antibodies to old things. Right. And, um, and the extent to which this really happens and how far away or how near each other the two different antigens have to be is something that's very difficult to tease apart. And that's why I think this shows up in some models and not in others. And the problem there is that if something varies a little bit, right? Like if we're talking about the variants of SARS-CoV-2, you're right. going to focus the response on the initial things that you were focusing on, which right. may vary, and then you become exactly. useless, but you can't generate the immune response to other parts, which could be useful because right. the immune right. response yeah. is focused on those original parts, like the receptor binding yeah. domain that has now mutated, and you're still trying to make that response right. because it would be the most effective, but it's not working anymore, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, I, and to put this in the context of SARS-CoV-2, for example, I was concerned that if we gave a booster to beta, that the immune system would just ignore it and mm-hmm. use the same old clone. Mm-hmm. But now with Omicron, uh, who knows? That's different enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind well, of thing. But influenza viruses, I mean, if your first experience is with an H1N1 and you get a very different H3N2, you still make mainly anti-H1N1. Right, but those are sort of beyond the the limit of original antigenic sin, right? But <laughs> but if you get Puerto Rico 1934 and then FM1 1935, I think it was, um, that's the original, original antigenic sin yeah, yeah, paper, yeah. right? Those yep. seem to be close enough together that, that this effect kicks in. So it, original antigenic sin is likely titratable with antigenic mm. distance. Cool. But well, we don't need an Omicron vaccine because the ones we have work. They keep you out of the hospital, right? Right. Plus, we all got Omicron already. So. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Yeah. That is twim, twim, not a twim. That is immune ah, 52. Immune, yeah. <laughs> Microbe.tv slash immune. You can find the show notes. If you want to send us a question or comment, immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, you can contribute and your contribution is tax deductible. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from the Rockefeller University, Gabriel Victoria, thanks so much. Good to see you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on the Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle, Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This is great. And I have seen the outside getting progressively darker. It is. It is. There I guess go. that's a sign. It's time to go. Brianne Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I learned so much. You ready for more tomorrow from John Udell? I am definitely ready for tomorrow. This has been a whole week of excellent guests. (laughs) Still a primer. (laughs) I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.